I should hurry to the observation post, but it is such a beautiful day that I find great joy in my walk across the meadow. Around the meadow, the engineer platoon is preparing some small jokes for the Americans, in the form of stumble wires connected with explosive mines, and hand grenades skillfully placed without their pins. I remember ten days ago when they mounted a light pressure mine under the toilet seat of a latrine near a French farmhouse that we could no longer defend. I imagine with satanic pleasure how an American sat down comfortably on the seat, only to have the mine blow both him and the stinking outhouse to heaven. But this treachery is a weapon against both enemy and friend. Suddenly, not five steps away from me, a grey-black mushroom erupts in which a fiery Satan bellows and spits glowing beams from all sides. Even before the sound and pressure waves reach my ears, I lie down in an old shell crater, holding the steel helmet on my head as clods and rocks fall on and around me. Then I feel a hot burning in my left foot. With horror, I observe a long tear in my left boot that reaches from the ankle to the toes. The pain increases. With difficulty, I try to remove the boot from my foot, but it causes terrible pain. Determined, I take my knife and cut the upper part of the boot from the top to where the tear begins. Finally, I succeed in freeing the wounded foot from the boot and pull off the sock. I look at the damage, which at first glance does not look too serious. One toe is split open from the root to the toenail as if by a hatchet. The blood gushes blue-red from the wound, soaking my entire foot. Calmly, I tuck a cigarette between my lips, let the red sap of life continue to flow, cleaning the wound and prepare the bandage. Where are you hit? An artilleryman asks abruptly, standing at the rim of the crater and staring at my wounded foot. You see for yourself, my friend. Come down and help me bandage my foot if you don't have anything more important to do. I wave to him. I am supposed to be scouting the destruction, but I think you need help he utters as he kneels next to me with the bandage. In the meantime, the whole foot has swollen. Lightly shaking, I am forced to lie on my back. So, says the man, the campaign is over for you. Whom can I inform? Just go straight north, two hundred metres, and there you will find Sergeant Herman at his observation post. He can send me to Mola, I inform him, and nod my thanks in addition. I take the splinter, which is about the size of a nickel, out of my boot sole, and play with it in my hands. What have you done? Mola asks, interrupting my thoughts. Why didn't you take the passageway? Now we are sitting in hot grease, and you are going to lie down in a white bed. Shut your mouth. What is this nonsense about a stretcher? I scold him, and the medic standing behind him. Try it first before I go. Angrily I stand on my legs, but the toe hurts so much that I come to my senses. So there grins the medic. Now be nice and tame and lie on the stretcher. Carefully they carry their angry load out of the crater, and a short time later reach the first aid station, where the battalion doctor has already arrived. It finally got you, he says and loosens the bandage. Only partly, I respond, although every time he touches me it causes strong pain. Yes, my dear, the toe, including the nail, has been split and damaged the bone. It will take several weeks before you are in order again. You will have to be transported to the main aid station. While the medic bandages my wound again, I frantically consider how I can get away from these quacks, as the doctor fills out a red-rimmed form and hangs it on my infantry insignia. It looks quite nice next to the insignia, he grins. What does this mean? I ask furiously. You don't think I will just leave my men sitting here? Yes, you can't even walk, or do you want them to have to carry you around? One of your men can take a bicycle, and you can sit on the front and report to the regiment first aid station. That is an order. I will call your company leader so that he can send a replacement for you, he instructs, businesslike. My eyes wander around, looking into the solemn faces of my comrades. I feel like vomiting. Herman will take over the platoon for the time being. I arouse myself finally. Here is my pistol, the maps, the binoculars and the compass, I say, turning to the battery sergeant. Mola, bring my shaving kit, fill my canteen full of Calvados and get your bicycle. Don't you guys worry about me. Do for Herman what you did for me. And in the meantime, I will see if I can't stay close by. 
Perplexed, some of them wipe their noses and others rub their moist eyes. Did you eat onions? I ask, forcing a laugh to save the situation. With all my energy, I suppress my own feelings that now bring to my consciousness just what these men mean to me. Muller goes down the hill quickly but carefully. The road is torn up by grenades, and it requires his whole skill and attention. Thirty minutes later, I am in the hands of a competent physician. It is just enough to send you home, he says, and gives orders to bandage me again. Couldn't I let it heal while I stay here? I ask. Nonsense, the bone is gone. You have to go to the main aid station, and a truck is just about ready to leave. He remains hard-hearted. I would still rather stay with the troops. I demand. You don't hear very well, Sergeant, or do you believe I will let you stay so that in a couple of days I will have to saw off your leg at the knee? Do what I tell you. The war is not yet over. You will still have your share of it in case you have not had enough already. Tetanus, he says to a medic and is already busy with somebody else. Submitting to my fate, I turn my bear behind toward the medic and the syringe. The needle penetrates my flesh and brings into my body the protection against tetanus. Shortly afterward, I stand on one leg in front of the ambulance and hold Mola's hand tightly in mine. So, Mola, thanks for everything. Say hello to the comrades and now go to Lieutenant Luetin. Tell him of my misfortune and that I will write to him from the hospital as soon as possible. See that you all keep well so that I can rejoin you. Come back to us again, he struggles still pressing my hand until the medic is forced to separate us. Shaken, I understand once again the deepest meaning of the word comrade. The medic drives quickly to the main aid station. The well-known ritual begins. Bandage off, bandage on. Fit for transport. Couldn't I stay here for a few days until the wound reacts? I ask the doctor after I have been taken care of. Listen, he considers my request, somewhat amazed. I don't hear that question very often. But do you believe we would transfer you if it were not necessary? We have to look at the wounds very carefully. Some don't have any. Just yesterday, someone arrived here with a fine bandage. His arm was completely wrapped in bandages, and you could see the blood that had seeped through from a hundred yards away. I thought to myself that he must have a hole as big as a grenade, but he didn't go through my station. By chance, I saw him getting on the bus. The bandage had not been changed, which prompted me to pull him out of the bus. He protested strenuously. We called the military police, unwrapped the bandage, and found no wound. I tell you this so that you know it is not so easy to get away from here, but you cannot run or walk in difficult circumstances, and then we will need the vehicles for the serious cases. We know that in the next few days the Americans will mount an offensive from their bridgehead and we have orders to send away all the helpless. Sleep now. Your bus leaves early in the morning. At seven o'clock, the bus, with its war-scarred load, rolls southward from the main dressing station. A medic, with a snow-white jacket and strongly oiled hair, sits next to the driver as our only escort. The mood is very good, because most are very glad to be out of the mess. In front of me, an SS corporal tells about the combat of his division. His right arm is in a bandage with wiring, which we front soldiers call simply Stuka, because it looks very similar to the wing of a Junkers Ju 87 airplane. He boasts of how his unit decimated the American tanks, and I wait for him to claim that he has personally eaten a Sherman tank. In time, we learn that he belongs to the SS division Goetz von Berlichingen, which is generally known as the Kiss My Ass division, and of whose bravery no one has any doubt. However, I let him speak without giving him any more attention, attributing it all to his youth and his first experience in battle. Silent and withdrawn, I sit on the green upholstered seat of the bus that is fleeing this hell. My thoughts are with the fifty-five men whom I was forced to leave. What will happen when the Americans actually start their long-anticipated attempt to break through? Will the thin German lines hold? What kind of way to conduct a war is it when no complete division can be sent into battle and only single, isolated battalions are sent out in front of the enemy artillery? It is impossible that the German high command was so surprised by the enemy that they simply threw units against the enemy to be squashed in a few hours through the meat grinder of a determined opponent. Something is rotten about this affair.
and gives the current rumours about the high-ranking deserters and traitors a sense of legitimacy. But why brood over such things which one cannot change and over which one has absolutely no influence? I force the troubling thoughts out of my head and look into the summer landscape while the bus, marked by Red Cross flags, pushes toward Avranches under swarms of enemy aircraft. Around one o'clock we leave Avranches and three hours later arrive without incident in front of the cathedral in Alençon, where we are provided with food and drink and find overnight accommodations in a chapel. Three Paris buses stand in the courtyard of the good nuns, who without any consideration of persons, follow their self-chosen life work of service. They have made our night's stay as comfortable as possible. Like me, the wounded of this new theatre of war wait impatiently before the opened doors of the buses. The doctors and medics strictly control the papers, identification tags and transport slips, which only an hour ago they filled out themselves. Within a few minutes, it is obvious why such strict control is necessary. There are indeed German soldiers who seek to put as much distance as they can between themselves and the front. Fools, I think. Now they will be court-martialed, given a warning, and their chances to survive with their lives are lessened, while the hardships are at least tripled. Finally, the doors to the fully occupied buses close. Be good, the medics wave to us, and the column rattles out of the courtyard. The way out of Alençon follows over the Sarthe, toward Mamers, Bellemé and nogent le rotrou where we make a brief stop to refresh ourselves. But the wheels of the mighty organisation of the German Red Cross drive us onward and bring us into Chartres just before dark. As night falls, I lie freshly bandaged, washed and cared for in a bed intended for wounded soldiers in transit. About ten o'clock, we arrive in Paris unharmed. Reserve Hospital, reads the sign over the entrance to a building near the north train station. We enter and are received by German medical personnel. Quickly we are sorted and distributed to the various wards. Before an hour has passed, I am washed and freshly bandaged, now in new pyjamas, lying in a white-covered bed in a nice private room. My wristwatch indicates it is 1pm as a young girl opens the door, bringing me back to consciousness. Mr Sergeant, your dinner, she says observing me curiously. It is unbelievable how fast life for a soldier in war can change, I reflect, while the young lady sets down my food. The French girl serves me meat soup, noodles, salad and goulash. I eat quickly and then end the wonderful meal with a swig of Calvados from my canteen, which Mola filled for my departure. Once again my thoughts return to the front. Why has fate been so openly generous to me, I ask myself and a dull fear comes over me that one day I will have to pay for this luck. It is hard to comprehend that I came out of that fury with only a scratch, but finally I am not the only one whom the gods of war may have saved for later. At 3pm the doctor makes his rounds and informs me that on July 6th the Americans attacked and broke through our lines at several points. Even here the war still has me in its grip. Alone once again, I envision my brave comrades, how they jump from one hole to another, contending for their lives. Although the doctor spoke of only a few breakthroughs, I am still convinced that the 101st American Paratrooper Division landed in the middle of our position, and that the thinly held line at La Haye du Puy came under heavy attack. At the moment, I do not know what is stronger in me, the joy that I am here in safety, or the oppressive fear for my comrades, and the eventual success of the Americans. Without asking if I am willing to leave, two French girls stand at the foot of my bed, steadfast in their demands. Everyday life in the hospital begins. Reluctantly, I relinquish my territory to the two souls bent on cleaning and hop to the door. Directly across the hall, the door is open. A man without a shirt, whose left shoulder is bandaged, stands at the wash basin, soaping himself. Good morning, he says, friendly. Staff Sergeant Boger is my name. Where did you get hit? He asks after I have introduced myself. Up by Saint-Sauveur, he answers, and blows a mighty cloud of smoke toward the ceiling. I came from that area too. I was with the 91st Air Landing Division, he informs me while waiting excitedly for my reaction. I know that group, a brave division. Around the 12th or 14th of June, 
we partly relieved you up there. Then you are from the 77th Grenadier Division, he interjects quickly. That's exactly right, I laugh excitedly over this accidental encounter. Come, we have to drink to that. The women have finally finished with my room. He takes me by the arm and pulls me into his room. Man alive, the Americans jumped directly from the sky into our positions. I can only say that was quite a racket. He continues on the theme after we take seats on the bed, and he retrieves a bottle of cognac and two wine glasses from the nightstand and fills them. Isn't that a bit too much so early in the morning? I toast him. It tastes better than the so-called coffee, he indicates, smacking his tongue. When did they get you? He asks after another hearty gulp that empties half the glass. On the 4th of July, near La Haye du Puits, I say, becoming more serious. That's only three days ago. What has been happening since the 19th of June? He inquires urgently. It was not too wild. When we arrived, the Americans were quite impertinent, but we quickly tamed them. The worst were the damned fighter planes and the heavy artillery. Naturally, they pushed us near the front lines nearly every morning, so that a counter-attack from us was necessary around 11 o'clock. Unlike the Russians, the Americans avoided any night fighting, which made our actions considerably easier. I explain in a few words what was happening at the front. That's about how it was with us after they established a foothold. But the first days were wild, and they had to fight bitterly for every foot of ground. The devil knows how it was possible that they could take Cherbourg. He poses the question which remains a riddle for all of us. There was certainly something rotten about it, I offer my opinion. It couldn't have been anything else because I know the fortress well enough to understand what it would have cost the enemy if the preparations for defence had been serious. Instead, the bastion fell silently, to our horror, on June 27th. No, it was actually the 26th, he corrects himself, and I agree. Finish your glass, the coffee will soon be here, and we can talk later, he suggests as we hear the clatter outside in the hall, and I hop out of the room and crawl into the freshly made bed. After drinking the coffee, the cognac I enjoyed presses me into the pillows for an hour. But at ten o'clock, the doctor stands at my bed with his secretary and an old nurse who takes my pulse. Everything OK? he inquires as I open my eyes. Thank you, doctor. I feel quite well, is my friendly response. Leave the alcohol alone. It will lead to nothing. If you're still too nervous to sleep, I will be happy to give you a sleeping pill, he advises in a fatherly tone. I met a comrade this morning who was in the same sector as me, and we had to drink to that. I excuse myself, realising immediately that the doctor has a sharp nose. So it's Boga across the hall? He asks with an understanding smile. Yes, doctor, I confirm. He likes to drink even without a reason. It may be a habit from Normandy. He nods at me and raises his index finger in warning. Presumably we can heal you here. He changes the subject. Tomorrow I will look at your toes. I appreciate that, Doctor, I say with gratitude. First, rest completely, and then we will see what to do. He offers his hand and leaves the room with the others. I reach for the remaining American cigarettes and watch the blue smoke form circles after the first puffs linger in the room. Oh, what bad air you have! A French girl named Jeanette interrupts my initial musings. She quickly closes the door and flings open the window. Always smoking and drinking. All soldiers drink too much. She starts her completely unnecessary lament and positions herself in front of my bed. I brought cognac for you, if it's okay, she says in a hushed tone. How much does such fun cost? I inquire, winking with my left eye. Twenty marks, that is not very much for you. In the city, your comrades pay more. She clumsily tempts me. Why don't you sell the stuff in the city? I ask. She does not answer, but only looks at me. She furrows her eyebrows, her nostrils seem to inflate, and her chest swells, then falls. Slowly, I take my wallet from the nightstand and place the money in her small hand. It is very hot in the room, Jeanette. Please open the door, I say, turning away from the situation that has become so unpleasant. She understands quickly. Feeling insulted, she rolls the bills together sets the bottle on the nightstand and leaves the room hastily. 
Certainly you are still very tired, she remarks as she turns back once more. Perhaps I will check on you tomorrow. Amused and satisfied, I grin internally and retrieve the oft-read letter from my wife from my bag. It seems you've had bad luck, Jeanette. You're not the right one for me, I reflect, and my thoughts drift back across the Rhine. After twenty minutes, the devil alcohol torments me until I am convinced that I must have a sip from the bottle. But I don't have a corkscrew. It serves you right, I mumble to myself. It is unfair to our comrade Boga to drink the bottle alone. Besides, it tastes much better when you drink with someone. With these thoughts, I slip the bottle under my coat and make my way to Boga. I nearly drop the bottle of cognac in surprise. Jeanette is lying in bed and is being comforted by Boga. Assuming that no one has noticed me, I seek my salvation in flight. But before I can reach the door, Boga calls out to me. Hey, you disturber of the peace, where are you going with the bottle? I thought I would disturb you, Boga, pardon me. I stammer in my embarrassment. Come on, sit down, he chatters, obviously in a good mood. Go, Jeanette, tomorrow is another day. He turns to the girl and swings out of bed. Unembarrassed, she dresses without forgetting to put on her makeup. As our glances accidentally meet, I observe that now her eyes seem satisfied. Smiling, she shakes hands with both of us and leaves the room humming the hit song, Please Come Back. While I light a cigarette, I observe how Boga pulls the cork out of the bottle. He is the proper representative of our warrior generation. About 29 years old, with long brown hair, lively black eyes, a straight nose, broad sensuous mouth, and a strong energetic chin. On his field blouse, which hangs over the stool, there are, next to the other orders and medals, the Iron Cross First Class. In the meantime, he has filled the glasses and hands one to me. Toast, my friend. We have to do something for our health. Suddenly, a medic enters my room, puts me in a wheelchair and takes me to the operating room, where the good doctor works with his skillful hands on me. After returning to my room, I lay flat in bed until noon, because the wound has become very uncomfortable. Nevertheless, the doctor expresses satisfaction with my condition and tells me that there are people here who put pepper and other materials into their wounds in order to stay in the hospital longer. I have noticed that it is much more pleasant here than at the front, but to use such means to try and prolong one's stay seems to me vile and cowardly. No one can escape his destiny, and what seems right at the time can prove to be wrong later, especially if one tries to deceive providence through crooked means. With a mighty gulp from the cognac bottle, I rinse down the dull taste, and then I light a cigarette. The next few hours are taken up with writing letters home and to the front. I hear a discreet knock on my door, and in response to my invitation, two sturdy, pretty and well-made-up girls enter my room. They are helpers with the Air Force, and they look wonderful in their uniforms. Smiling, they trip to my bed and extend their hands amicably. Ink from Gorlitz! and Renata from Dusseldorf. They lay down a pretty bouquet of wildflowers on my night table and in response to my invitation, take a seat. In contrast to the girls, who act natural and uninhibited, I become nervous and reach for my cigarettes, offering them one. Without any restraint, they accept, and soon rings of blue smoke drift comfortingly to the ceiling. They inquire about the nature of my wound, and I briefly tell them about the front, doing so with a few humorous words. As we continue our cheerful chatter, they begin to unpack their presents. A small but very tasty cake with chocolate frosting and white powdered sugar, a notebook and a silver picture frame. Soon everything is carefully organised on my night table, and my wife looks out from the new picture frame, amused at the scene. Before I always had something against girls in uniform, but now I am silently asking these two to forgive me. Their behaviour and manner are so nice and uncomplicated. Their pretty faces beam with the joy of giving. I earnestly reproach myself for my previous stupid prejudices. How can I thank you? I laugh, happy with this pleasant change. If it has brought you joy, that is thanks enough for us, Ing says modestly, with a most pleasing voice. But I beg you, joy is not expression enough for what I feel, is my sincere compliment as we hear a knock on the door. Boga, pushing two girls ahead of him, enters my room. They are warmly greeted by my visitors. 
Gallantly, he extends his hand to the women, then turns to me and competently takes my pulse. Quite high blood pressure, my boy, he shakes his head seriously, which brings everyone to laughter. I could tear my hair out because the crazy character has embarrassed me, and no way comes to mind to extricate myself from the affair. In the meantime, his two female visitors have found a place to sit at the foot of my bed, with Boga arms crossed between them. And such people sacrifice their free afternoon, and here in Paris, I pick up the thread of conversation again. What is that in comparison to you men? Inge explains, almost sadly. We girls will never be in the position to compensate you more than in the most modest manner for your hardship and suffering. It is actually not as bad as you may imagine. One grows quickly accustomed to it, and even the constant danger helps one to value life more. Everyone, whether man or woman, does his duty regardless of where fate has placed him, I add, as the conversation slowly drifts into political and military matters. Boga disappears and comes back a moment later with a bottle and a glass. Come now, children, he says, filling the glasses. That is enough of this fruitless theme. Let's drink to victory, and not in the least to your graciousness. We cannot do anything more for the situation at the moment. That is the most reasonable idea that I have ever heard from you. I raise my glass. After the second glass of cognac, I have the utmost pleasure listening to the long-missed chatter of the girls, who discuss the shameless, cunning French women, and in particular, the simple-mindedness of the German soldiers. The blonde Ingeborg, whom Boga brought into the room, observes, It is very hard for a respectable girl to secure the man her heart desires. If she does what he wants, then he stays away because he believes she would do it for everyone else. If she doesn't do it, then he thinks he is wasting his time. I get up after lunch in an unpleasant mood and soap myself at the wash basin. I am at odds with myself and wipe the foam from my face. Why should I shave if I can't leave the building? The shaving brush falls back into the basin, filled with water. I have got to stop drinking. The women must stay out of my room. The radio should not blast so loudly. The wounds must finally heal. No, I should have visitors more often. There is a shortage of conversation and entertainment in this place. I should be able to go out. The noisemakers on the floor should offer better music. How are you doing today? The doctor asks amidst all the commotion outside. When I lie down, it's all right, doctor. I answer the good man. He steps closer and looks at me. Haven't you received any mail? No, not here. I answer in a disturbed tone. Were you satisfied with yesterday's visitors? He wants to know. Thank you, I can't complain. I keep it short. Make a note to get him a cane. He turns to the secretary. I will look at the foot tomorrow. In a friendly manner, he takes my hand. Don't make any trouble for yourself. Even this will pass. Finally, I have a reason to be angry with myself. How can I act in such an impertinent way towards such a good doctor and man? Especially a man who has always approached me like a fatherly friend. Why is it that sometimes, against my own will, I hurt people who are dear and precious to me? He won't worry that much about me in the future, for I do not deserve any better. Dinner arrives. Jeanette seems to have a chip on her shoulder. Angry? I tease her sarcastically as she serves the apple sauce. Yesterday the girls were here and today I can't do anything right, she fumes. You must not try to comfort so many, Jeanette, I try to kid her. She slams the door shut. Bon appétit, I grin maliciously to myself, and in spite of it all, I eat well. The joyless day comes to an end without having seen Boga. After breakfast, I sit clean-shaven in the wheelchair, in which the medic will transport me to the examination room. After a nurse loosens the bandage, the doctor, just as friendly as ever, inspects the wound. It is coming along all right, he says, looking up. But continue to take care of your foot so that the toe will stay intact later. You will get a cane so that you can find something to do outside of your room. He then gives instructions to rebandage my foot, paying attention to where the splint is placed. Half an hour later, I am in my room. I have come this far. I can walk with a cane. Distrustfully, I squint toward the club that the medic has so matter-of-factly hung on my bed. As I do so, I recall the story of a man at home who, because of a wound he suffered during the First World War, 
received a pension and was always seen with his cane, until a new law took away the pension. He then threw the cane away, declaring to the amusement of his friends that if he did not receive a pension any longer, then he had no more use for the cane. From that hour on, he was never seen again with that companion of so many years. Shortly before 2 p.m., I wander over to Boga. I have not seen him for a while and find him polishing his boots by the window. He grins unashamedly. Today I'm going into the city, he says proudly, and spits on his boots to bring out the high shine. My, my, I laugh. The brothels will be happy to see a stallion like you. Rubbish, he contradicts. I am not one for those stinking booths. Do I look like someone who would have to pay for it? Calm yourself. Where are you going? I probe deeper. That's the problem, he screams indignantly. I don't know my way around this damn nest. If I had known it yesterday, then one of the Air Force girls could have been my tour guide. The best thing for you to do is to go to where the girls live and have them darn your socks. That is something that awakens their wifely feelings. And if you already have your boots off, Keep your mouth shut, he interrupts me. The devil doesn't even know where they live. How long have you been a soldier, Boga? I wink at him. What has that got to do with it? He roars. Because you don't even know that in a military establishment, all visitors must leave their names and addresses with the guard, I instruct him. A radiant smile appears on his face as if by magic. Suddenly he is in a hurry. The rest of the evening I spend in the company of two bottles of beer, bringing my diary up to date. At 10pm, at lights out, Boga still has not returned. First thing in the morning, I look in on Boga. The stench of sour alcohol in his room nearly takes my breath away. Quickly I open the window and observe the unconscious sleeper lying with his mouth open on the bed. A nurse carrying a thermometer in a glass softly enters the room. You are visiting so early. She is startled and glances in amazement around the room, where Boga's boots, pants, shirt, jacket, cap and belt are scattered all over. Irritated, she puts her hands on her hips. Just look at this. That's the way men are without women. He deserves someone who would at least pull down the blanket and put his naked behind in the bed. Angrily, she picks up the things and puts them on the chair according to regulations. No longer interested in Boga's temperature, she turns to the door and hisses to me, Please leave the window open. It stinks worse in here than a bar in the Rhineland the day after Mardi Gras. I discover in the wash basin a beautifully labelled bottle of Calvados, still corked. Quickly I step to the window to give the bottle a thorough examination. Yes, yes, take a good look at it, says Boga unexpectedly from his bed. It belongs to you, Helmut. I finally convinced an old bartender to let me have it. Then I had to defend the bottle from the Parisian women of the night with more difficulty than my machine gun position at Stalingrad. I will take a bath to wash away last night's sins, and I will excuse myself to the sergeant major for being late. Really, they cannot be angry with me when I couldn't find my way back in this foreign and blacked-out Paris. About noon, Boga returns from the administration office somewhat depressed. My pass is now with the chief doctor, he says. That could be bad, Boga. Can't the chief just let the whole matter slide? I ask, with an unpleasant feeling in my stomach. It is too late for that. I should have gone in sooner, he says apathetically. Try to talk to the head doctor. Perhaps he will deal with the matter, I counsel him. Oh, shoot. They can do what they want. They will anyway, he answers, dismissing it. From late afternoon on, we play cards and do not end the inane game until the lights are turned out. Two days have passed without anything meaningful happening. Today, at 11.20am, Boga comes back from the doctor in charge, to whom he had to report for questioning. I have been anxious all morning about how the situation regarding his furlough will unfold. As Boga crosses the threshold and comes toward me, no words are necessary. The expression on his face indicates that he will be punished. You must open the Calvados helmet. I need it very much to get the bad taste out of my mouth. After that, I will pack my things. I must report to the personnel office today for assignment to the front, he says, rather depressed, and sits on the edge of my bed. What happened, Boga? I ask, although I am not particularly surprised by the outcome since I went through a similar experience in my earlier days. Not much. 
he answers in a subdued voice. Everything followed its usual course. Instead of returning at 10pm, we did not roll in until 1.50am. The guard, following his orders, noted the time, and the rest you can imagine. You know how these chamber pot swingers are, and how they use their diagnoses, or whatever they call that pile of shit. So, with regard to me, I am considered healthy. At 3pm, I can sign out. He ends his report and tips a double shot of Calvados down his throat. A toast to you, Carl, I offer in response. You know, I had always thought that we would savour these drops on an especially nice occasion, and I did not know that this Calvados would be the reason for our separation. That is why it must pay its debt with death. Knowing the two of us, we will have carried out the sentence by three o'clock. We enjoy ourselves immensely, and the troubled times seem much easier to endure after the alcohol has mixed with our blood. First, I will go to the personnel office and get a 24-hour pass. Boga seems to read my thoughts. Each soldier who is in Paris for the first time can get it, he indicates with confidence. How long will this damned war go on? I ask after a pause. If it ends this year, then we are the losers. I don't want that. We have stood in the shit too long to have peace at any price, is his opinion. That's my view as well, but how can it continue? I really would like to know. You will have to ask Adolf that personally. As we hear, the great blow is coming soon, but I don't believe everything anymore. He fills the glasses again. These stupid rumours have been stuck in my throat for a long time. Ever since Stalingrad, they have been feeding it to us. And all the while we have been going downhill, I defend myself against the eternal propaganda rumours. That is not really so, he encourages me. Some things do have their justice. There are weapons that are nearly finished that will give another face to the war. But when that will be, we do not know. Let's hope for the best, Boga. I raise my glass. Let's have lunch now. That's the way it shall be, he rises, slightly swaying, and goes into his room to pack. After the meal, I take the bottle and glasses and go with deep sorrow in my heart to Boga. It is always the same in the military, I think, as I cross the hall. One gets to know comrades that he likes and then loses them. You come as though I called for you. Boga receives me. I have just finished. I don't feel very good in my skin when I see you in your war paint. Me neither, but let's not talk about it. There is nothing that can be done about it, he says with resignation. Do you at least know where our group is? I ask while he fills the glasses. No, I think I can find that out in the personnel office. He hands me the glass filled with liquor from Normandy. At 2.35 p.m., Boga gets up and takes out a cigarette. The time is up, my friend. I must go, he says and extends his hand. Be good, Helmut. I'm happy I got to know you. Perhaps our paths will cross again in the future. Take care, Carl. Be cheerful and greet Inge for me. I wish you all the luck in the world. Perhaps we will see each other at the front. I press his hand firmly and accompany him to the door. A friend has left me. Dully, his steps fade away on the linoleum-tiled floor. Since Boga's departure, I have not left my room. I am reading the book, The Command of Conscience, and I have forgotten the world around me. In the middle of the night, a medic awakens me. The Fuhrer will speak, he says, and with these four words, he tears me out of my sleep and my lethargy. Now in the middle of the night, I want to ask the man, but he has already left. Quickly, I get out of bed and make my way out to the corridor. Subdued march music sounds out of the loudspeaker. The wounded stand in groups around the speakers. Bits of conversation reach my ears. In the homeland, the swine are rising up trying to stab us in the back. I hear an upset man say who wears a thick bandage around his head. The main thing is that the Fuhrer is still alive, another interjects. What happened? I ask as I approach a group. A plot against the Fuhrer, nearly everyone answers at the same time. A feeling of distress lies on my heart, and the picture flashes before my eyes of Hagen as he stabbed Siegfried in the back with his spear. From the loudspeaker we hear the familiar voice of the Fuhrer. I am speaking to you so that you can hear my voice, a handful of ambitious officers, as a sign of providence. It has come this far. Now the Germans are eating each other. That is what all those strange decisions add up to since the invasion. 
Sold and betrayed, all the brave German soldiers stand on the fronts and fight in hopeless combat. What do you say, comrade, to this situation in the homeland? A man standing next to me asks as I turn to go. I don't understand it anymore, I answer, subdued. Hopefully they will push through and finally bring the men out into the open. The man fumes and balls his hands into fists. There may be people in the general staff on whose feet Hitler has trodden, but the fact that in this hour of their country's greatest need they try to play politics, which will lead only to chaos, I will never understand. The anger hits me. They are saboteurs who have shifted the war into reverse, and now they have revealed their cards. I hear the man continue before the door to the room closes from the inside. What do these officers want? who certainly have a vision of the highest war strategy. Why do they resort to undertaking a plot to overthrow Hitler? Reason tells me there are only two possibilities. Either they intend, through sabotage, to bring about the inevitable defeat in order to turn the people and the army against Hitler and then seize power for themselves, or we are indeed at the end of our strength, and they are trying now to save what can be saved. But where do these rumours about secret weapons come from? The fact that they have already put the rockets into action is proof that there is some truth to what is said. How will things go from here on? He will fulfil his destiny in that the new weapons will be implemented, and the war will come to an end sooner or later. I answer my own question, since this simple solution comes closest to fulfilling my own wish to go home. But still, I lie in bed for hours, smoking continuously, until sleep finally carries me away from this miserable world. This is the second part of the memoirs of a German soldier who was a prisoner of war. The continuation of this story will be posted tomorrow. I kindly ask you to subscribe to this channel because your support motivates me to create more videos featuring the valuable memories of soldiers that deserve to be heard. When we reach 1,000 subscribers, I will release a special video as a token of appreciation for your support.